It's Let's ride. Time for the words that are recited before each and every game here at Dodger Stadium. Take it away, Finn. It's time for Dodger Baseball. What's going on, Dodgers fans? Thank you for listening to another episode of the Incline Dodgers podcast. We are presented by the Fan Sided Podcast Network. Your Los Angeles Dodgers pitchers and catchers have officially reported to Arizona. We saw some videos of Julio Urias, Clayton Kershaw, Diego Cartaya, Will Smith, Austin Barnes. The whole crew is there. Pitchers and catchers have reported. Spring training will start in just a little bit over a week. On February 25th, their first game is against the Brewers. We got a lot of topics to cover as we get ready for spring training. Jake Reiner, how's it going? What did you want to start with today on this episode? Well, it's exciting. You know, pitchers and catchers reporting. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about Clayton Kershaw. Saw his uh, couple of clips from his bullpen today. He looks good. Like, he looks in shape uh, and looks really sharp so far. Uh, we can get into uh, this weird WBC story that that just came out about him. Um, but the first thing that I want to talk about is kind of what everyone's been talking about across the baseball landscape, which uh, is the cheating that went on throughout the years, most recently 2017, 2018, um, because uh, Evan Drellich's new book, uh, has a lot of new things in there that we didn't know. And one of those things is, is that he has a couple of sources, one of them being a Red Sox source, which is kind of suspect, if you ask me, given the fact that they uh, were caught cheating themselves, basically accusing the Dodgers of implementing some sort of sign-stealing cheating thing uh, in 2018. And then the other part that he mentioned in his book, apparently there was a Dodger source. This is the first time I'm ever hearing of a actual Dodger source when it comes to this stuff, saying that in 2017, they used a base runner system where someone in the video room decoded signs and sent a signal to the base runner, kind of like what the uh, Red Sox and Yankees were accused of doing. But here's my thing. Where's the evidence? We have no evidence of this. There's nobody that has come out and said that there is any video evidence, any picture evidence, any um, evidence with faces to them. So like sources that are willing to go on the record, there's been none of that. Uh, according to the Red Sox source that Evan Drellich talked to, it says, quote, the Dodgers have always been the thing that bothers me the most because they're the biggest cheaters in the world in the effing world, they were doing it against us in the 18 world series. They got caught by major league baseball and major league baseball did nothing. That is a Red Sox source telling Evan Drellich. And to me, it's just such a coward move. You're, if you're going to make the allegation that the Dodgers are the worst offenders, the worst cheaters out there, put your face to that story. Tell us more, give us the evidence because until I see that, until I hear anything that resembles anything of evidence, I'll change my tune. But until that time, I I'm I'm going to continue to refute it because it's it's egregious what the Astros did. There's video evidence to prove it, the trash can and everything like that, and also all the accounts, not to mention Mike Fires, who went on the record because he was actually on that team, basically corroborated everything that uh, Evan Drellich and Ken Rosenthal had reported. And there's been so many allegations hurled at the Dodgers, but not one named source has gone on the record, either from the actual team or from another team that is accusing them of doing this. So it's just this, the most asinine set of allegations I've ever heard and seems pretty baseless. If you ask me, I don't know. What do you think, Kev? Number of thoughts. One, why are we still talking about this? What year good, are we in yeah. now? Good, good question. 2023. 20, 20, yeah. Four or five years ago. 
Um, so Evan Drellich, Evan Drellich has gone from what reporting on the lockout because that was like his whole thing a year ago to now he he wrote a book about this a thing that I could care less about. Two, Dave Roberts has already come out saying that MLB has cleared the Dodgers of any wrongdoing. So like you were saying, there's no evidence whatsoever. If Major League Baseball is saying that the Dodgers did nothing wrong, then clearly what are we here talking about? This all just stems from one Astros fans being little bitches. Like you won your World Series in 2022 now. Can we just please move on? You won your first. So go fuck yourselves. Like we're done. Let's just move past this. Like I'm over talking about this and that unnamed source. I have no idea who it could be earlier this off season. We had Alex Cora, I guess, admitting that the Astros were cheaters as well, feeling very apologetic and guilty, but then he does it anyways with the Red Sox. So he screwed the Dodgers not once, but twice. And then you got David Vasse defending him, but that's a whole nother story. But Alex Cora, he shouldn't even be having a job in major league baseball. Like what he did in my opinion is still worse than Barry Bonds or Sammy Sosa, any of those steroid users, like ringleading an entire cheating scandal for not one, but two teams that should be a lifetime ban. So Alex Cora, if you're listening, you can go fuck yourself. Um, and that's, that's all I got to say right now. I, I can't imagine what that uh, Red Sox clubhouse is going to be like. And if Alex Cora is ever going to address it with any of the new Dodgers, former Dodgers that have joined the squad, Kenley Jansen, Justin Turner, um, KK Hernandez already on that squad, Alex Verdugo already on that squad. Um, I wonder if there were any conversations or if there is going to be any awkward tension there. I imagine there would be, especially from Justin Turner, who, if you remember, was very outspoken when the news came out that the Astros had cheated. So that's something to keep in mind. But the other the other piece of of news, I guess you could call it news that came out of that book was apparently this Red Sox source. I assume it's the same one said that he observed Jock Peterson going up to uh, Chase Utley and an MLB official asking if they have if they decoded the signs or not. And to me, it's like, that's it. That's all you have. What? OK. You know, like you can that that could be taken any number of ways. Did you decode the signs that could have been in game? That could have been any number of things. But there was there's never been any concrete evidence besides that. And and if you're the Red Sox source, who obviously probably still works for the organization, which is why that source has remained anonymous, I would have to guess. But to me, if like you're you're supposed to be an anonymous source, you should have all of your ducks in a row. You should have every single piece of evidence to be able to hurl out there to support your claim. Otherwise, what are we doing? And I do want to point out some of the things that Dave Roberts said. You kind of touched on it, Kevin, but there are some quotes that I just wanted to read for our listeners. Um, Dave Roberts said, all the things that went down, punishments and all that stuff, MLB did a great job of being thorough. That's not my job to be the judge and jury. And then he said, uh, MLB investigated the Dodgers following the 2018 season, and they came away with nothing, which adds up because they still, years later, there still is nothing. There's no concrete evidence. Um, and then Robert said, our guys did do a great job of relaying signs and looking at sequences when the catcher gave them. That's the school of baseball. That's gamesmanship. That was never anything. There was never never anything illegal about that. And so, yeah, you know, sign stealing is a part of baseball. Everyone knows that. And if you can do it in game, standing on second base and decode the signs in real time, then more power to you. And honestly, if 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 a guy on second base is decoding your signs, you need to take a look at your signs and 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 change them up. But now, I guess with the the pitch com thing, it's kind of taken that element out uh, of the running. But th this is you know. This is just infuriating to to keep having to rehash and have Dave Roberts answer questions about it. it it's just asinine. And I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait till anybody has any evidence to, to, to show me. And if they do and if it's convincing, I'll change my tune. But until that point, I'm going to remain, you know, as steadfast as I've been on this. All right, cool. What do you got next? All right. The next on the list um so it's official. The Dodgers have signed Jimmy Nelson, Alex Reyes, and David Peralta. We talked about uh, Alex. Well, did we talk? I don't think we talked about Alex Reyes. We, well, we forecasted we... Alex Reyes being a Dodgers target, and it happened 
like a day later. Yeah. So I'll get you, I want to get your thoughts on him in a second. Um, we did talk about David Peralta, but Jimmy Nelson back in the fold. I love it. Uh, and apparently, according to Dave Roberts, Jimmy is entering camp healthy, which is terrific. Uh, if he can be a he can he can do anything. I mean, he's a former starter, so he could be a long man out of the pen. He can also be a um, setup man, a bridge man, fireman. He was he was when he was healthy, he was pretty damn electric coming out of the pen. Uh, and then unfortunately, he got he got hurt and has been out for some time. So he can come back and be in this bullpen. It's it's awesome. Um, Alex Reyes, though, your guy, Chris Camelo's guy. Uh, and it happened pretty shortly after we did our last episode. So I'll let you gloat. All right. So I'm excited for this move. It's going to take a little bit of patience, though, because he isn't exactly healthy. It might take a month or two into the season until he actually is contribu- contributing to the Dodgers at the big league level. Uh, he hasn't pitched since 2021. His last pitch thrown was actually that walk off bomb to Chris Taylor in the wild card game. But that season, he was an all star, had a 324 ERA, 29 saves. He was supposed to be this generation's next big starter. A lot of experts were calling him the number one pitching prospect in baseball, but like some other great athletes, just kept getting derailed by injuries. So he made a name for himself out of the bullpen till he got hurt, had the shoulder surgery. Now here he is with the Dodgers. He has uh, the option to make 10 million if everything goes right this season. That seems like wishful thinking, but he does have a 2024 option, so he could be part of the Dodgers for multiple years. Uh, I like the combo and mix that this guy offers. 97 when he was last throwing on his fastball and sinker, and he can also throw a slider and curve mix. So it's hard to you know really speculate what his role will be out of the pen, but you know they they lost guys like Chris Martin and Tommy Canley, and this Dodgers bullpen was already pretty stacked, but you can never have enough arms. So I like the move. Uh, you mentioned those signings. They're all major leagues, big man, uh, big 40 man roster moves too. So to make that official, they moved Walker Bueller, Blake Trinan and JP fire Eyes into the 60 day IL. I thought Nelson was a minor league signing, but he's actually a major league as well. So um, just thoughts on Nelson real quick. Like you mentioned was electric out of the pen, had a 186 ERA only through 29 innings with 44 strikeouts though was about to be like the next big high leverage arm and reclamation project for the Dodgers until he had to undergo Tommy John surgery. So that's why he was out all of 2022. They declined his option, brought him back for about a hundred K more than what he was going to make. So he's getting 1.2 million, but I like it. Yeah, me too. Another name on the market that you guys, we talked about last week is Zach Britton. And according to Ken Rosenthal, Zach Britton is on the Dodgers radar. Your thoughts on him? Yeah, so the Dodgers have to carry two lefty relievers all season, in my opinion. And we know Alex Vesey is likely one. Caleb Caleb Ferguson should be the second, but he had a really sporadic season last year. I felt like he had the potential to be his 2020 self, but he kept going on the IL and he was even left off the postseason roster, I think. And so it just seemed like there wasn't a lot of confidence in him. And that, that seemed to piss him, piss him off. So maybe that's going to actually put an edge on him this upcoming season where he has something to prove. So I'm, the jury's not out on him yet. I think he could still be a great high leverage arm. But then you have Victor Gonzalez, who's just been a no-show the last two seasons, but he's still on the 40-man. So I feel like spring training for Victor is probably his last shot. Otherwise, he's likely going to get dfa just because – there's only so many 40 man spots you can afford. And then Justin Brule, who's just another kind of okay, more on the scrub side though, does have some potential, but doesn't throw hard. So if the Dodgers were to add Zach Britton, I do have some concerns. How much would he cost? Because this was an all-star, one of the best closers of his heyday for Baltimore. And he's struggled the last two seasons. So you would think that maybe he has to do a prove it, prove it deal age 35. So I'm not sure how much is left in the tank, but if this is another flyer, why not? Zach Britton could resurge himself with the Dodgers. I mean, there's no other organization that you could throw out there that would do a better job with these types of flyers. Let's take a quick break right here to talk about tick pick real quick. If you haven't heard about tick pick by now, I'll tell you firsthand, they're the best ticketing website out there. And we already talked about spring trading being right around the corner. You can go to TickPick, download the app, save $10 instantly by using the promo code INCLINE. 
at checkout, you'll save $10 right away off your first purchase of $49 or more. So you can go see your favorite team, play some spring training ball, but that's not all they offer. You can go see your favorite band at any venue, any city, and you can go see your favorite sporting teams. I know NFL just ended, but you still got NBA hockey, probably WNBA. I'm sure you can buy tickets to tennis as well, maybe golf, but you got to download that TickPick app. Best prices out there, no service fees, so you know what you're paying. And all you got to do is just download that app and go to TickPick. And trust me, you're going to love it. Former closer, Zach Britton. Um, a lot of closing experience. Definitely was uh, a huge part of that Baltimore Orioles run a few years ago. Alex Reyes. I mean, you have a ton of players, a uh, ton of pitchers in this bullpen that have, have been closers before and or have closing experience. So the Dodgers have a lot to choose from. I know that we've talked about Daniel Hudson. If he's healthy, um, he is kind of the, I would guess, the leading candidate if they were to name a closer. So it's got to be Evan Phillips. I mean, he's the best yeah, reliever. They... Think about it. In the, no, in, the but... re- in the regular season, Postseason is a different discussion, but in the regular season, it feels like most games are won or lost in the ninth inning. So who's going to probably get the bulk of the saves? I mean, it's going to be a committee, but if it's, let's say, Machado, Soto, and Cronenworth, who's getting the ninth? It's got to be Evan Phillips. Oh, 100%. I think that who you know he's going to get the best part of the order. Like, yeah. whatever, and and and... And it's dictated by circumstance too. I mean, if if the game is in the balance in the seventh inning, then he'll be in the seventh inning. But it, like you said, if it's if it's the ninth inning and they've got Murderer's Row coming up, then then he will be the guy. And I think it is telling because uh, Mark Pryor uh, basically confirmed what we've all been thinking is that there is no defined closer right now. And I feel like if they were going to go with Evan Phillips and name him the closer, they would have already done that because he's proven that he can be that guy. And I would trust Evan Phillips with my life as, as the closer of this team. So I think they, I think they're going to want to, you know, leave their options open. Um, But if they were going to name a guy, I don't think it would be Evan Phillips just because they want to be able to use him, how they've used him uh, uh, last season. Well, they said they want it to happen organically. So to start the season, it's going to be an open audition. It could be right. Bruce Star Gratterall, for all we know. Maybe he finally puts it together. Yancy Almonte, we've talked about him before. I think he's earned a, a raise. Like he should be the eighth inning or seventh inning next man up high leverage arm. And then Daniel Hudson was so good in his role last season. He's basically Evan Phillips 2.0. You could use him in the seventh inning or you could throw him in the ninth in a high leverage spot too. It's, I think game by game circumstances are just going to be all over the place and you kind of just have to approach it game by game. Like if Evan Phillips pitches one night, we don't necessarily have to go to him back to back nights. Maybe you, it's Daniel Hudson one night, Evan Phillips another night, not like the old school traditional way where we were using Kenley Jansen back to back to back nights sometimes to get saves. Yeah. And I've said this before. I think last year's bullpen from top to bottom is, is, probably the most complete bullpen I've ever seen as a Dodgers fan. And that's without Kenley Jansen at the back end. I felt that Kenley obviously was our star closer for so long, but a lot of those years, he was the only guy at the back end of that bullpen. And it was really hard to get ball to him, but now you have so many bridge options. And I think now that that, that, that they don't have Craig Kimbrell kind of giving you fits in the ninth inning, this has the chance to be the best bullpen the Dodgers have ever had. I mean, if you look at it on paper and and what transpired last season. So I'm really, I'm really excited uh, for this bullpen, even if they don't end up with Zach Britton. All right. Next on my list uh, is a story that came out today uh, that Mookie Betts went to driveline this off season uh, to work on some things. One of the things he said that uh, one of his takeaways was is that he needs to bulk up and add strength. And according to the Dodger beat reporters out there, Mookie Betts was hovering around 170, and now he's 178. 
So he's added some some bulk to him. Uh, hopefully that means a little more consistency. I think that was one thing that he did want to focus on because he had flashes of brilliance last year, but also uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of peaks and valleys throughout the whole season, even though overall he had a pretty great season. I did find his quote though, really kind of strange the way he phrased it. He, he asked him, they asked him why he went to driveline and he said, my employer told me I need to go. Just a weird phrasing. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. I didn't hear him say it, but just the phrasing of it is just like, why can't you just say, yeah, yeah, the Dodgers wanted me to go and I, and I went. It's just kind of a weird official way to say it. But what do, what's your takeaway? I don't I don't put too much into it. Just to be honest, we know he start he came out of the gates really slow last season. Was batting like under two hundred the first two weeks, give or take. Then he went off. Then he kind of cooled off. But then he went off again. And then he cooled off and then he went off again for a little bit. And then by the time we were in September and the postseason, he faded. And it's going to be the same story with me every year. Just be hot in September because that's not what we had last year. Have the momentum. Hopefully this is the type of team that just clicks in the second half. And that's that's typically the type of Dodgers teams with the exception of 2017, where the ones that got hot near the end go on long postseason runs. 2018 is the perfect example miserable in the first half took off in the second half i know i just said 2017 they was the opposite they were cruising the entire first four months and then in september they fell off and then got it together but it's it's the same thing 2019 it felt like they were getting kind of cold near the end first round exit but then 2020 they were hot throughout the entire season won the world series 2021 same thing completely got hot in the second half made it to the nlcs just couldn't overcome the injuries yeah I, I I'm expecting quite a bit for Mookie Betts this season, given all of the departures that we saw this off season, you know, this is Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman's team. And yeah. it's, it's an exciting new era. I think of Dodgers baseball with those two guys at the top of the order leading the charge. And I love what I love about Mookie Betts is that, no matter how great he is or how great he, you know, ends up, he always is looking to improve in different, different ways. And you can't say enough about him. And you, you, you kind of, I know that uh, Chris Taylor took a trip to drive line. I mean, these guys are working around the clock to refine their skills because they, they know how much the Dodgers are going to need to rely on them. And, and especially Chris Taylor too, after his down season in, in 2022. Yeah. I mean, With Chris Taylor, he said it himself, basically the week they got eliminated, he took like one or two weeks off and he, he got back to work right away because like you said, he had a really disappointing 2022 season. And I think someone like him cares and he's going to want to bounce back and prove it to not only the teammates, but the fans, because there's a lot of criticism out there. Another interesting yeah. quote, though, from Mookie Betts on a different subject about why he's playing in the World Baseball Classic was as simple as he just wants to be teammates with Mike Trout. <laughs> That's he great. Said, he said he doesn't get to play with him much, which is true, obviously. So he wanted to seize the opportunity and play ball together. Yeah. No, I love that. I think uh, it's going to be this is this Team USA is, is going to be stacked. But there's a perfect segue to the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, with Clayton Kershaw. Because it just came out, I saw a report from the LA Times that his status for the World Baseball Classic is a little uncertain right now. The Dodgers expect him to be there. Kershaw expects to be there. But there's this sort of insurance coverage thing that is being discussed out there whereby it covers you if you have injury-prone players. And Kershaw you know, has a history of injuries. And um, I don't quite know how it works or or what have you. And they asked Kershaw about it. Um, and he was very vague. He was sort of just like, I'm just going to let the process play out. But Brandon Gomes, uh, the GM said that he expects Kershaw to be there. I mean, he's the, he's the ace of this staff. So it, it, you know, it would be really disappointing if, if he didn't end up playing for this team, but it looks like it's just kind of a formality at this point. Yeah, that would suck. I know that the World Baseball Classic has some interesting rules where there's really tight pitch counts, especially in the first round. I'll have to review it, but it was something pretty low, like 75 pitches or something. Yeah. Um. So that's uh, it for the WBC. 
One of the weird things that came out today, and I'm surprised that uh, he was as candid as he was, talking about uh, Milwaukee Brewers star pitcher Corbin Burns. He was interviewed today talking about his arbitration process, and he felt like the Brewers pretty much lowballed him. And he, according to him, the Brewers were kind of hell bent on basically not paying him paying him the least amount of money required and that's kind of lame um but the but the big headline that came out of that according to to corbin burns is that that the brewers said in the meetings that he was one of the reasons why they didn't make the playoffs how insane is that first of all even if even if that were true you don't tell your star pitcher that He's one of the reasons why you didn't make the playoffs. And it's such a stupid comment too, because it's, this is not basketball. This is not like, you know, one star can affect everything. He's just a pitcher and he's a pretty damn good pitcher. He's an all-star Cy Young pitcher. And to me, it's like, uh, is he, you know, there's no more uh, pitchers hitting in the national league. So he can't hit anymore. What about the offense? What about the rest of the team? Makes no sense to me why, they would even say that. And he even said there was no reason for that. There was It was not necessary to bring that up. So a lot of bad blood between the Brewers and Corbin Burns, according to him. It's the relationship isn't good. And I follow the Milwaukee Brewers account on social media, and they've been posting a lot of spring training con- uh, content. And all the Brewers fans in the mentions are irate. And they're basically just calling them out about this Corbin Burns mess um, but what what do you think of it? I mean, the, the reason I bring it up is because I know that the Dodgers obviously would would love to have someone like Corbin Burns on their team. And with this kind of bad blood brewing, it could mean that he, you know, that there's there's more of a likelihood that he could get dealt. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting storyline as the season progresses, because I think the Brewers are going to be one of the underperformers to entering this 2023 season. I don't like what they did this offseason. They have a great starting staff, but after you get past Burns and Woodruff, a lot of question marks. Peralta can't stay healthy, and then you get to their bullpen. They always seem to find guys that can plug in right away and are effective, but they did get rid of Hayter, but they got Devin Williams. But if Williams were to go down, who knows what happens? But this is going to be a tough one because the Brewers apparently don't want to pay him. I don't know why they lowballed him. As you mentioned, there was, he wants a contract extension. It doesn't appear they're going to do that. So I'm not too um, in deep. I don't know too much that goes on with the brewers, but from what I can see from the outside, I don't see this one ending very well. I really respect Corbin Burns for saying what he said. Not a lot of players will open up like that. And I think it really speaks volumes about who he is as a person because he basically stood up and said, I'm not taking this shit. Like, yeah, this is this is unacceptable, especially I mean, he's the ace of their staff. I mean, this is not some role player or some, you know, middle reliever. This is the ace of their staff, Cy Young Award winner. And he's like, I I deserve better. And and guess what, Corbin? You do. So come on over to the L.A. Dodgers. Yeah. We'll, we'll 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 get you set up. This is uh, that's uh, actually a good setup for this question from Catch the Blues on Twitter. Is the rotation highly vulnerable? He throws out how guys like Kershaw, you mentioned, injury prone, Gonsolin couldn't hold up for a full season. And then you got, you know, Dustin May coming back. He's going to be on innings limits too, I would imagine. Do they need to add an additional innings eater? I think that they have the innings eaters waiting in the minors with Bobby Miller and the rest of Pepio and the rest of those guys. Um, so I think that they have their cheap innings eaters and the, and what it allows them to do, because those guys have options is to bring them up and send them back down as opposed to going out on the market and finding a guy that has major league experience that you have to give a major league contract to, and doesn't have any options to send down. So I think the Dodgers are, are set with what they have. I mean, it's, it is a little concerning because the, the rotation is very injury prone minus Julio Urias. I mean, the rest of those guys are very injury prone. And I think the Dodgers know that. And I know, and I also know that they believe in their young pitchers and, you know, seeing guys like Bobby Miller come up and, and pitch and fill in a role. I mean, heck he could come in there and, and, and win a winning, win a rotation job. And then 
And then you don't have to worry about that. So I don't think that they need to go out and get an innings eater. But again, I mean, if they have a chance to get a Corbin Burns, I mean, you got to explore that and and you kind of will make have to make room for him adding a player of that caliber. Yeah, unfortunately, I think when we get closer to the trade deadline, something that we're going to be talking about a lot is that the Dodgers need to trade for a starter. It yep. just seems inevitable. No matter who they sign, last year, Walker Buehler got hurt. Who saw that coming? So you just never know. Um, I also want to see if they're going to go to the six man rotation, but with the amount of guys they have in the bullpen, I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, they, they, they have a plan B, they have their backup young arms re- ready to go. But I mean, with, with that many injury prone starters, you know, that they're going to try and, you know, swing a deal at, at the deadline, uh, whether that's Corbin Burns, Otani, who knows, um, what did I want to do next? Oh yeah. This is a kind of a cool thing. Uh, they did a little bit, a little profile in the LA times on JD Martinez the other day and kind of how he, I just love, I just, I already love him. I already love him. Cause he, he, he was talking about how uh, he wants to win a world series. And that was a huge motivation for him to want to join the Dodgers. I mean, it's, it's no secret. And he took a, took a discount to do it. Uh, and he kind of he kind of realized that the Red Sox kind of were going nowhere and that that the the Dodgers were his best chance at his age to to win a World Series. And, and I love that. And he has a history of taking young guys under his wing. Uh, he famously took Mookie Betts under his wing and he won AL MVP. Not saying that Miguel Vargas is going to win NL MVP this year, but um, he has a much better shot at having a breakout type season if he is working with JD Martinez. And that appears to be the case is that JD has been working out with Miguel Vargas. And I mean, you got to love that, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure when we had had first initially talked about JD Martinez signing with the Dodgers, one of the things that I pointed out was how big his leadership is going to be in this clubhouse. And I think I actually directly said, I bet you he'll work with Miguel Vargas. So looks like that's coming through. Uh, I think J.D. Martinez, who will be the everyday DH, they confirmed that. Not that that's a shocker, but I'm excited to see what he does. I think his bat is going to be electrifying. This is a guy that destroys lefties. Even in a down year, he was still an all-star last season. So I'm excited. I think, you know, Dodgers fans are still trying to get over the losses of J.T., Bellinger, Trey Turner. But we got a lot of new exciting guys that are veterans. They're going to play with a lot of passion. They're great clubhouse guys. Miguel Rojas is another guy who connects with his teammates. I mean, he was able to motivate guys in Miami, and that team doesn't try to do anything to win. And he got, he encouraged guys like Jazz and um, other Marlins names. You can't really name them because they're, they're, they're Marlins, but regardless, <laughs> <laughs> he got them motivated. So, side for Rojas, side <laughs> for JD Martinez. David Peralta will be another exciting clubhouse ad as well. So, a lot of grit. Yeah, a lot of grit. Love this team already. Um, this is going to be a fun watch. I, I I just thought of a question for you. All right. So I saw I saw some uh, some pictures today of uh, Justin Turner in Red Sox uh, attire. Um, I saw uh, some pictures of Trey Turner uh, in Phillies garb. Um, are there any players out there right now, former Dodgers, um, that went to other teams that you still wish we had on this team? Still, that was still with us. Do, do you from just or, who we lost in this last offseason? No, I'm saying I'm opening it up to any any All former right. Dodger that's currently playing. Perfect. This will answer this question. So from Lakers underscore three one zero on Twitter, who will benefit the most from the end of the shift era? And to answer both these questions, it's Corey Seager. I don't know why the Dodgers let him walk. I think they offered him $285 million or something along those lines, which we knew was not going to be enough because he wanted over $300 million. First of all, when they had the shift last season, I think he was the most robbed player statistically. I think he lost like 70-something hits to the shift, and he proved to stay healthy. His glove was great. Um, I think just all the defense issues. I think he's just trying to stay healthy, to be honest. He got paid, so now he can go all out. But I think that the Dodgers, we got Gavin Lux, who I think will be fine. But there's just something about having a guy like Corey Seager in your lineup 
who can just get out of bed and straight up hit. This yeah. is the most consistent Dodgers hitter, maybe next to Justin Turner, that I've seen over the last decade. And I really wish he was still in our lineup because not only is he great in the regular season, he's also extremely clutch in the postseason. Yeah. I think that the Dodgers didn't want to give him the money that he got from the Rangers. I mean, clearly they didn't. Um, and I, I, I mean, I'm still okay with, with, with letting him walk just, just based on the commitment that the Dodgers would have had to dish out for him, for a guy that has struggled historically to stay healthy. And, um, I think that if he were to go to any team, I mean, the Rangers was a perfect landing spot. I mean, I I think that the Rangers will figure it out. They certainly have a lot of talent in place, um, and they 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 might surprise everyone this year or in the or in the coming years. But they're you know they they've they've got a pretty stacked lineup and with Degrom and um and and Andrew Haney now in their rotation. I mean, they 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 could be good. And so, but like in terms of a of a team that really can't come back to really hurt you and, and unless the Rangers and both the Rangers and Dodgers make the world series. Um, I was fine with letting him walk, but I also have flashbacks of Adrian Beltre when the Dodgers let him walk. And that was always my, just always, I always missed him every year that he wasn't playing for the Dodgers. Um, so it may, it may turn out to be kind of the, the, the same thing. Uh, for me, it's, it's Justin Turner. Um, it, I was thinking about it, and I know I know that they want to give Miguel Vargas a, a shot and, and give the younger guys a shot, and, and Justin Turner's kind of declining. But I don't know. I, I just he was he was my favorite position player with the team, and I I'm I'm gonna miss him and and his and his leadership. So that watching, was it for me. Watching players retire with your team is so overrated, unless it's like a true legend like Kobe Bryant. I find it so overrated. Like I don't want to watch players at the very end of their career just limping around on a team especially a team that's trying to win if if the team sucks then yeah i get it that's that's good good way to get you into the park but like for the dodgers right now i don't want it so goodbye justin enjoy boston <laughs> uh, we have one more question from billy martinez reaching out on instagram and i think this is an awesome question when the dodgers return to socal at the end of march for the exhibition freeway series against the angels which two pitchers and two position players will raise their stock the most this spring. Uh, do you have, do you guys have guys in mind right now? Cause I got to think for a second. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, position players wise, no shocker here. Miguel Vargas. I think he'll have a great spring and solidify himself as an everyday starter. Um, more of a fringe hitter. I guess I would have to go with, um, James Altman. He already proved he can make the major leagues, but barely got to play. He is competing for that center field job. Honestly, I don't think the competition is that strong. If it's just Trace Thompson and Jason Hayward, I fully believe that Altman is more talented than both those guys. So I think he's going to blow past the competition and win that center field job. Pitchers is tougher, but first one, I got to go with Pepio. I think he's become the forgotten man. And I think he's going to get a lot of innings pitched this season for the Dodgers and quality innings. And then another guy talked about him a couple of times, but I think it's Tyler. I got to learn how to say it. Tyler Sire, Sear. I think oh. it's Sear. So we'll go with Sear. I think he's going to have a great spring and you're going to see him. For me, it's Gavin Lux, uh, one of the position players. I, I really think that he's going to put it together this season. He's going to have a breakout year. And uh, another position player that I think will raise his stock is Will Smith. Um, I think that he is is going to take the next step in his career. He's a middle of the order bat. He knows that now. Um, he's he's done it for a few seasons, so I expect him uh, to you know, raise the, raise the bar this season, uh, for pitching. Um, I think we're going to be surprised by, uh, Noah Syndergaard. I'm really excited. I love his attitude. Um, I think that the Dodgers really could, could, you know, turn him into the next Tyler Anderson. And I think he's got better stuff than Tyler Anderson, more overpowering stuff, I should say than Tyler Anderson. So I'm really looking forward to that. And then, um, I think I was going to go with Pepio too, because he, he struggled with his command. His stuff is really nasty. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see him make a few more starts and, and, and get it together. Awesome. Was there anything else, Jake? 
That's it for me, bro. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of the Incline Dodgers podcast as we get you ready for spring training. In the meantime, make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast or follow us on YouTube to watch this video format. But in the meantime, everyone have a great rest of your week and go Dodgers.